Good morning. We are here to celebrate. So I'd like to see some smiley faces. This, you all know who Ray Taliaferro is or you wouldn't be here. And you know that he was upbeat, that he was fun, that he was interesting, and he had the biggest voice that you've ever heard. And, you, and it was very distinctive. So just think about that as you hear from his family and friends today and um, just rejoice in that and celebrate that, the man that he was. So um, John, I know you have some well, let's things do the to Smith say. Sisters first. Okay, we can do that. The Smith sisters are Ray's cousins and they are Jocelyn, Deirdre, Yvonne, and they were the Cathedral Three. And if you saw the videos, um, they were the little girls who were in front of Ray, as I understand it on the video. And they're here to, uh, to celebrate their cousin.
the amazing Smith sisters. And John Rothman, Ray and I worked at opposite ends of the day, so I didn't see him very often. But John Rothman here saw him a lot. And <laughs> I know you have many stories, John, about your time with Ray. I, I am John Rothman, and many of you knew me as Ray Taliaferro on the weekends. <laughs> Ray was a remarkable personality, a great man, and a man that gave so much to this community. Uh, you'll hear today about his work with the Leukemia Society, the NAACP, with the Arts Commission. Uh, on so many levels, Ray Taliaferro made a difference in the life of the people of San Francisco. Uh, I want to simply say, that he was my friend, I miss him, and this really is, as Gloria Duffy described it, a celebration of life, not a time to be sad. In fact, I think the only regret I have is that Ray is not here to enjoy this with us. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to call on Gloria Duffy, who, as you know, is the Commonwealth Club embodied, and let me be clear as we call Gloria up, we are here because of Gloria Duffy, she extended the Commonwealth Club, the refreshments, the flowers. She worked diligently on the program, and so I want to really give her a big hand and a great welcome. Thank you so much, John and Rosie. Really, thanks to the many people. John Rothman, our staff here at the Commonwealth Club, Ray's son, Rafael, his other family members and friends for all the work and generosity of spirit to make today's event happen. Welcome to you all, for, and thank you for coming. My role here is very small, and you will hear a lot of, uh, more from others today about Ray. I will say that Ray Taliaferro was an extremely multi-talented individual. He was a gentleman who was always responsive to any request to help. Uh, he was on the Commonwealth Club board here and then the advisory board for two decades. And we did ask him to help in a number of ways. He hosted many programs for us here at the club. He was never able to see this beautiful building, but on our stages here and there at hotels and our other, other uh, headquarters, he interviewed people, the likes of Walter Cronkite, uh, Richard Chamberlain, he also pointed out important people and topics for the Commonwealth Club to host. Uh, he, uh, George Dobbins, our vice president for programming who's here, often went to Ray and discussed who should be on the Commonwealth Club's podium. Uh, there's one particular uh, episode that George will remember well when Ray told him that Barry Bonds lived in his building and he offered to pursue Barry as a speaker, I guess in the hallway or around the building, uh, at the Commonwealth Club. I'm revealing some secrets about how the Commonwealth Club does its work. <laughs> Ray followed up. He did convince Barry Bonds to speak at the club, and then he handled so very well the slightly awkward program with Mr. Bonds uh, when some allegations of improprieties about him arose just before the event. Ray was a consummate diplomat and brought the best out of the event uh, despite that. In all of Ray's varied roles, a common thread was equity and justice. The views he expressed on the radio, his suggestions of speakers for the club, the way he took care of his girlfriend, Julie, after she became disabled, the way he deployed his time and musical talent for those with illnesses, leukemia and lymphoma, for civil rights, from his younger age right up to his work with us at the Commonwealth Club. He, he supported the civil rights and uh, the, uh, be, uh, the benefits, benefits for those with illnesses and other challenges. His life was a model, especially in these sometimes uncivil times. He fit very well for the Commonwealth Club and what we try to do to make sure all voices are heard. So we thank you, Ray, for being that model of civility, that gentleman, the person who always helped. Thank you. I think I have the wrong, oh, there it is. Okay, so 
this is this is good for me. This is fun for me because I get to introduce somebody that I actually like. <laughs> no, Mickey Luckoff um, in many ways is responsible for the long career that I had at KGO. And he is our next speaker, Michael Mickey Luckoff. <laughs> Well, John and Gloria, you're pretty much covered it all. Um, you'll hear many, many kind things about Ray here today, and they'll all be very well deserved. Ray was a delightful fellow. He was a perfect gentleman, always well-dressed, and incredibly enthusiastic. I still remember the many times that Ray was going to bring uh, Barry Bonds to the station, and he couldn't wait to tell me about it. I'm still waiting to see him, though. <laughs> I knew Ray as one of a kind. In addition to being an absolute champion of the liberals, Ray believed in serving his community, and serve it he did. He served, as you've already heard, this very Commonwealth Club, and he was a very successful president of the Leukemia Society, and you'll hear more about that later. Ray was also a great patron of the arts. And who can forget his incredible loyalty to his beloved Julia, uh, Julie? Um, it was something that really kept Ray going himself for many, many years, and he was very proud of what he's able to accomplish. Ray was one great fellow employee. Never did we ever ask Ray to do anything that he wasn't on the spot and willing to do. He was very devoted to the station. He was a damned hard worker. He, uh, most of us suspect that Ray never slept, never. <laughs> and he was also very versatile because when running in talk radio station, uh, it's not infrequent when the talk host doesn't feel quite right today. So Ray would have done his 1 to 5 a.m. shift, and Jim Easton just didn't feel like coming in that day. Hey, Ray, would you mind doing 1 to 4? Oh, sure, I'll be glad to do it. And he did it very, very well. Not his usual ultra-liberal act that he did all night, but a real good talk show host, and he was really that. He's a, he was a wonderful fellow and a wonderful fellow to have in the radio station. Ray's 1 to 5 a.m. talk show was heard from Canada to Mexico. It was top rated. He owned the all night radio in the Bay Area. And he was one of the reasons KGO was as successful as it was for so many years. Uh, pardon? Yeah. Um, Ray was a favorite when we took him on a remote. People always wanted to see who Ray was. We did all star remotes and we took the, the entire cast to various places. But as his, his work for leukemia, and Ron will play a great excerpt from him later. His work for the Leukemia Radiothons, Ray helped us in no short order of raising over $18 million over the course of his career. <laughs> Tad Toby, who is the provider of this very room we're sitting in today, told me earlier this week that he always counted on Ray to keeping him awake from 1 to 5 in the morning. And believe me, the philosophies between Ray Taliaferro and Tad Toby are as different as night and day. <laughs> but here is what many of you don't know. Ray was really a secret weapon for KGO. Ray, with his fantastic ratings, was the lead-in to the morning news on KGO, which led the market for many, many years. And Ray was the secret that took that audience and lent it to the morning news. Morning news guys always thought they were great, we did too, but Ray's the one that gave them the lead in every single day. <laughs> Never let it be said that Ray wasn't a great guy and we will all miss him. Thank you, Ray. And Mickey just um, mentioned Ron Owens, who is like the king of radio in the Bay Area, and Ron and I have the same issue. I have bad knees, <laughs> and, and Ron has bad knees now. But anyway, Ron Owens, who was number one, and still is number one in my book. Thank you, Rosie. Boy, to follow that introduction and then follow Mickey, that's tough. I mean, Mickey was the world's greatest general manager. He's been a great friend for M Mickey and I have been great friends for 42 years, except for the two years we didn't talk to each other. But other than that, when, when people talk about radio talk show hosts, you often hear them say, well, you know, he's exactly the same in person as he is on the air. 
Well, those of us who were fortunate enough to work or know Ray Taliaferro would never say that. Because on the air, he was bombastic. Off the air, Ray was gentle. On the air, Ray talked incessantly. Off the air, he listened to others. In short, Ray was a consummate pro. He knew exactly what he was doing. Mickey referred to this, too. He knew what he was doing every minute on the air. He understood if you do a talk show, it has to fit the time slot that you're in. You, you, you don't do the same show at 3 in the morning that you would do at 3 in the afternoon. It doesn't work like that. And by working the all-night show, he could shake up listeners in a more, what should I call it, aggressive way. <laughs> I like that phrase. Anyway, because of Ray, people were able to engage in great conversations, and nothing was better than when Ray really got involved with a caller, and they would go screaming back and forth. It was heaven. You would not go to sleep. And I don't know. Was that the, I guess the idea was to keep him awake, wasn't it, Mickey? Not that the things that he said weren't his true beliefs. I mean, they were. Let's be realistic. Uh, we know that if Ray were here today, I doubt, well, maybe he would. Nah, I don't, I don't think so. I, I doubt he would really be the guy who would turn around and be the head of a re-elect President Trump group. Um, <laughs> but we all know Ray wouldn't be, wouldn't be proud of what's going on right now. If anything you want to miss him for, it's imagine the shows that he would be doing right now. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Not that all the things that he said weren't his true beliefs. I mean, they were. But one of the things I admired most about Ray was the passion he had for his beliefs, the willingness to stand up for what he really believed in. There were many years I'd wake up at 4 in the morning because I'd go on at 9, and I'd wake up at 4 in the morning and get the last hour of his show, and I'd prepare, and you hear what Ray is talking about, and I'd always appreciate his take on current events, even when I knew he was wrong. <laughs> but it made for a good show. And I wasn't alone in listening to Ray in those early morning shows. One of Ray's favorite stories, I remember he told us when we went to an all-star remote, was the way that Frank Sinatra once called him and said, whenever in the Bay Area, I listen to you. And I thought, wow, Sinatra. Put him on a list of people to get, never got him though. <laughs> Ray's work on the Art Commission, always serious, consistent, solid. He, he just loved this city. It brightened my day always. I'd bump into Ray on Union Street or Russian Hill or wherever he'd be walking, and we'd talk a few minutes, grab a cup of coffee perhaps, and then he'd be off to the symphony, the opera, the ballet. He was and will always be thought of as a real San Francisco icon. But what most impressed me, and Mickey touched on this too, what most impressed me, what really just bonded me was watching what he did and the way that he handled just life when Julie, his beloved Julie, had a stroke. He devoted his life to her. He was there every day, day after day, month after month, year after year. He just really devoted every minute to her, and so much so that, in fact, he, that KGO had set up a studio in his house because he wanted to be there if, God forbid, something happened during the night. He wanted to be there for Julie. This was the real Ray. And then, of course, the tireless work that he did for the Leukemia cure -thon. as Mickey said, $18 million, a local radio station. Ray devoted himself to the cause. It's spearheading to raise money to find a cure for the disease. And of course, the Leukemia cure -thons were legendary, and the star was Ray. That's where Ray's supposed to come in, Mark. It's not enough. Thank you. We can do that. You really uh, think we can? Oh, oh, oh no. as a matter of I, fact, I, I, that, that's you, just the beginning. Now, you look me in the eye and tell me 837 isn't enough. Uh, 837, we're very, very proud of that. We should be. It certainly sets a record. It's phenomenal. But it's hardly enough. It's not enough? No, it is not 837,000 no. is not enough? No. You want a million dollars? Uh, absolutely a million dollars. You know how hard that's going to be? Um, it's not going to be difficult. It's going to be like pushing a mountain up a hill. Well, I understand. But for this station, we can do it. Uh, <laughs> those cure were really legendary. They, they really were. There were times I'd kid with them during the breaks and all that. I'd try and impersonate his, my, my, my. And I used to do that all the time. Or uh, I'd talk about how he suggested, if it was a rainy day, for example, that the bad weather was, of course, George W. Bush's fault. And he'd laugh back and... Yet I still thought a tiny part of him probably believed that. <laughs> Bottom line is, Ray, like all of us here, I miss you. You gave us many, many years of joy. But the truth is, for all the class that you have blessed us with, we'd like more. Or to put it another way, barring the words that you used to say to me all the time at the end of the cure -a -thon, it is not enough.
Thank you. And our next speaker is iconic in San Francisco. And I remember um, as a news person speaking his name on a daily basis depending on what was going on in the city. Former San Francisco Mayor Frank Jordan. It's a joy, really, to be here today celebrating the life of Ray Taliaferro. Life is the little shadow which runs across the grass and loses itself in the sunset. Life is fleeting. When you look at the shadow, you don't see it moving, but it slowly, quietly moves into the sunset. I join with all of you today to pay our respects and to celebrate the life of Ray Taliaferro. John Steinbeck wrote in his famous novel, East of Eden, a person after they have brushed the dust and chips of their life will have left only the hard, clean questions. Was it a good life with purpose? Have I done well or ill? Because in the long run, life is for one generation, but a good name is forever. Today we celebrate the good name and the many accomplishments and lasting legacy of a special friend, Ray Taliaferro. We all remember his powerful, robust, dynamic, booming, baritone voice as he generously gave of his time and his talents, serving as master of ceremonies at fundraising auctions, political rallies, neighborhood events, the Commonwealth Club, our monthly luncheons at the Big Four, and of course, the KGO Leukemia Telethons. His limitless enthusiasm would always energize, motivate, and activate the audience. I can still hear, hear him today introducing people in his own rousing, unique way, and you'll all relate to this. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to our incredible, magnificent, spectacular, <laughs> handsome, incomparable honoree tonight. <laughs> he would either make them feel like they were the most impressive person in the world, or Wow, that can't be me he's introducing. <laughs> As a, rap, a radio talk show host, he was involved in the passions and actions of his time. The capacity to engage and communicate with his audience using flair and style was an essential element of his very soul. His vast radio listening audience was his extended family, and he believed people's opinions mattered. He delivered his insights on politics, current events, or a variety of endless controversial issues with impressive, often skillful wit and intelligence. Why? Because he was a natural. His language was strong, engaging, colorful, incisive, always emphasizing hope and optimism for the future. At times, he could be in total disagreement, as, as Ron said, with someone, but he chose never to denigrate or demean the caller unless they deserved it. <laughs> He debated ideas rather than their feelings. He engaged his listening audience, his focus of attention invariably zeroed in on compassion for societies forgotten, neglected, or excluded, and always fighting for a more just and equitable society. In a more personal way, Ray became a close and true friend of mine in word, deed, and loyalty. He was a, he, we had great chemistry, and I dearly loved the man. I treasure the shared moments that brought us together throughout each of our careers in joining the, we always enjoyed the meaningful pursuits in our great city of San Francisco. He instinctively knew what will ultimately matter, not what you learned, but what you taught. That's more important. Not that you, your competence, but that your character is more important. Ray found a perfect place to invest his humanity as a talk show host on the radio. He came to the defense of those needing a voice, always trying to be respectful and fair of their divergent opinions. He mastered the art of communicating, interacting, encouraging, educating, and challenging, if necessary, by laying out choices for all of us to evaluate. 
Every 4th of July, Ray would invite friends to his residence at Hyde and Lombard Streets. He had a spectacular view of the bay, particularly Pier 39 and Fisherman's Wharf. During the good weather, we enjoyed the fireworks. Other times in rainy, foggy weather, Ray would entertain and mesmerize us with his gifted piano playing skills and uh, his talents, which were of symphony orchestra quality. I'm sure many of you have heard them. The grand finale would always be his personally baked sweet potato pie, <laughs> a wonderful family recipe he proudly shared with all of us. My home is located at Fillmore and Pacific, right in the heart of the Western Edition, and uh, there is a plaza there that I walk to periodically, and I noticed recently concrete squares. They're real, located right in the, uh, the heart of this Western Edition open area, and it uh, had identifying American, uh, African-American role models worthy of recognition on the ground like the Hollywood Walk of Fame. My focus was drawn to one in particular, and it read, Ray Taliaferro, civil rights advocate, KGO radio talk show host, co-founder, National Association of Black Journalists, and I would, if I had the opportunity, add a couple more. An accomplished professional musician, goodwill ambassador for San Francisco, lifelong humanitarian and caregiver. Rest in peace, Ray. Our love, friendship, and gratitude go with you. God be with the day we met, and God be with the day we meet again. Our next speaker is a woman who has never been afraid to speak her mind, which is what I like about her a lot. You know her. Angela Alioto, former president of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors and San Francisco legend. <laughs> I don't know about coming before so many incredible speakers, uh, but it's a great, great honor. You know, people used to always stop and ask me, so aren't you related to uh, that other Italian, Ray Tagliaferro? <laughs> I go, yeah, I am. I'm very related to Ray. Let me tell you a story about Ray Taliaferro. You know, I started writing down all the things I wanted to say about Ray, but that's totally ridiculous because uh, I don't have enough on my phone to fit everything I would say about an incredible, uh, respectful, dignified, class act, San Franciscan, class act. So when my dad was mayor, uh, uh, Ray was always by his side, literally always by my side, because, you know, my father was a frustrated, well, he played the violin, but he was a frustrated pianist, frustrated poet, frustrated writer, and, of course, Ray was all these things, so he kind of joined next to Ray and felt that, you know, he had incorporated all of Ray's talents. So... <laughs> We would have these huge ceremonies at the, at the Fairmont Hotel, and um, uh, Cyril Magnan and Vernon Kaufman would always say, Joe, your daughter isn't smiling. Well, I was always there because my mother didn't want to go. So I was going to all these things. I wanted to be riding my horse in rodeos. I didn't want to be doing, you know, smiling at everybody that I didn't know. So they went to Ray Taliaferro, and they said to Ray, well, could you please make Joe's daughter smile when she's sitting up there next to, you know, the Emperor Japan or, or whoever it happened to be? And so Ray came up and very, very, very nicely. Angela, this is important for San Francisco. You need to smile. I go, smile? He goes, you need to smile. Even if you don't want to be here, you need to smile. <laughs> I said, okay, Ray. I'll smile. So it came to the point where every time I looked at Ray's uh, Talia Ferro, I couldn't stop smiling because I realized, and Vernon Kaufman and Cyril Magnum were delighted, and Dad didn't know what happened to me. So uh, that's how I've always thought of Ray. Throughout the years, we have been such great friends. He has supported me in everything I've ever done, whether it was politics or whether it was my civil rights little law firm. When I left City Hall, I had lunch with Ray at the Rubicon, and I said, Ray, I'm pretty sure I should go into civil rights. <laughs> Asking Ray Talia Farrell whether I should go into civil rights <laughs> was a little ridiculous. Um, and uh, I said, what do you think? He says, I, I think that'd be an absolute I, great idea, but, but don't forget, smile. <laughs> 
I'm smiling, Ray. I'm, I'm smiling. Three and a half years later, when we had been in contact because I was uh, uh, starting to do trials, and you know, not a lot of people do trials, but Ray always told me I could do trials, so I did trials, and, and so did my father. Uh, and so um, three and a half years later, I won the largest verdict in civil rights history. I got a call from Ray Talia Farrell. My, my, my. <laughs> I bet you're smiling now. <laughs> you know what he said was, my dad is smiling and dancing in heaven with this verdict because dad had just missed the, the Wonder Bread verdict. And so ever since then, and, and uh, uh, literally since I was 14 years old, Ray Talia Farrow has been the smile in my life. He always will be. I'll miss him very, very much. But I'll tell you one thing. Every time I think of Ray, I will never, ever be sad. I will always be smiling. I call our next speaker, Miss B. You know her as former KPIX anchor, reporter, Barbara Rogers. Good news. Thank you, Miss Rosie. I call her Miss Rosie. <laughs> Hello, everyone. And uh, it is quite an honor to be one of the people on this program today. But awfully, awfully intimidating as I look out at this wonderful group of speakers who've been up here today. But, and so many of them have pointed out some of the same things that I will be saying about Ray. But ever since the day that I heard that he was missing, which was the day after Thanksgiving when I got that information, I have sort of heard that booming, wonderful voice in my head. And I'm sure a lot of you have too. I suppose that's because I got to know Ray from his voice before I ever met him. Everyone who knows me knows that I am a night person often still up reading, writing, puttering, doing laundry, vacuuming, doing whatever in the middle of the night. And many times I am listening to the radio. So often, especially in the early years after I first came to the Bay Area, which was almost 40 years ago, Ray's golden baritone, even though he wasn't on the overnight until the mid-80s, mid but I started to hear him then, even though his golden baritone would be what helped me get through all the things I was doing at night and helped to entertain me. And helping me also to get to know and understand who was who and what was what in my new city. He and Herb Cain, if it hadn't been for them, I don't know how I would have made it through all those years as a journalist. <laughs> Ray was that voice through the night for thousands, probably millions of other people, who for whatever reason were still wide awake until the wee hours of the morning. There was never a shortage of interesting topics on Ray's program, and definitely no shortage of strong opinions. As someone else has already pointed out, I can only imagine what he would be saying now if his radio show and he were still in his heyday about living in the age of Donald Trump. Just take five seconds to think of some of the things Ray might have said. My, my, my. I can't say them on the mic. <laughs> I didn't always agree with Ray's point of view, and sometimes I was angry enough with either something he said or one of his callers to turn off the radio. But the voice always stayed in my head, and the fact that he was a pioneering broadcaster who had opened doors for African Americans while I was still in college was a fact that was definitely not lost on me. And then one day, I actually met the man behind the voice. I don't remember exactly how or where we first met, but I think it was in Hunter's Point at a senior citizen event, which would be appropriate since he had lived in, had grown up in Hunter's Point. And he was the kind of person who impressed me as much in person as he did on the radio. He was such a gentleman, and no matter when or where I would see him, he would always pay me a nice compliment in that golden honey-coated baritone, and he would say, my, my, you look lovely today. My, my, you're even more beautiful in person than you are on TV. Well, I tell you, I'll miss hearing that. Who wouldn't miss hearing such compliments? 
I am one of the co-founders of the Bay Area Black Journalists Association known as BABJA. And the last time I saw Ray long enough to have a chat with him was on the night that BABJA honored him for his outstanding career achievements in October of 2011. That was right after he left KGO Radio. Ray was not a founder of BABJA, but according to Bob Butler, a past president of the National Association of Black Journalists, Ray was one of about four dozen journalists who met quietly in 1975 to strategize on ways to advocate for better coverage of the black community and opportunities for advancement for black journalists who were working in the mainstream media. Bob is here today, and uh, he gave me that information. Those meetings led to the creation of the National Association of Black Journalists, which was no easy task back in 1975. Ray was unable to attend the meeting where the charter was signed, but he is considered a founder by those who signed that original document, and his contributions and ideas were a part of the organization's original constitution. And of course, the NABJ still thrives today. Ray was inducted into the NABJ Hall of Fame in 2011, and the Ray Taliaferro Entrepreneurial Spirit Award was created that year and named in his honor. The $5,000 award is given annually to a recipient who is recognized for the introduction or significant innovation of a new or existing media enterprise. The award is funded by the Barry Bonds Family Foundation. The person who won the award in its very first year was someone here in the Bay Area, a past president of our local NAB chapter, Babja. She is Michelle Fitzhugh Craig, and she's somewhere out there. Raise your hand, Michelle, because she's here today. Thank you, Michelle. I asked, I asked Michelle to give me a few thoughts that I could share with you, and this is what she wrote, quote, I did not meet Ray in person until it was time to receive the award that bears his name. All that I heard about him before the summer of 2011, I didn't begin to do, didn't rather begin to do justice to the kind and supportive man he was. We at Shades Magazine, a publication that celebrates all women of color, are proud to forever be the first recipients of the Ray Taliaferro Entrepreneurial Spirit Award from the National Association of Black Journalists. And I personally am honored to be able to have called Ray a friend. Thank you, Ray. You always will hold a special place in my heart, end quote. And thank you, Michelle, for sharing your thoughts with us today. And Michelle speaks for all of us whose hearts are just a little bit broken because Ray has left us so unexpectedly and so soon. And we are all really sad that we didn't get a chance to say our last goodbyes to him. It is so ironic that the man who was known as the talker apparently had no one to talk with in those last hours of his life. But I'm sure that Ray, who was a church-going man, is now up there in heaven. And I suspect that he is keeping God and all his angels up late into the night talking. Thank you. I was pondering how to introduce a legend, someone I have tremendous respect for. Our next speaker is really the gold standard for women in broadcasting. She blazed the trail and set it on fire. Miss Belva Davis. Well, this is indeed a day that none of us looked forward to. It was the day when I found it almost impossible to prepare remarks that would have meaning for me as well as meaning for you. Because Ray and my friendship were based upon some silly stuff. <laughs> After he got to be a big guy and my mom was around and she was one of those Baptist ladies who had a friend and they loved to get together at night and talk about whatever they thought they wanted to talk about and then let Ray lead them down any path that he chose to. <laughs> and so she would always tell me, not that she wasn't proud of me, but that, how come I couldn't let people talk on my show the way Mr. Talia Farrell does? Let, <laughs> let people say what they're thinking. <laughs> 
so that was the battle that we fought uh, between my mom and him and his style and what he did. And I realized how important what he was doing was in my life, too, because it was the way my mother found to understand what I tried to explain to her in newsroom terms, where we got nowhere. <laughs> so for that, I am long indebted to Ray. And then for the while, he, I'm a little bit older than him, so I didn't really want that to be the first thing one would say about me in introductions. <laughs> but that might sometimes come up, especially if you're a young, flighty man, and you've got this person here. And so it's nice to say we're in the business, but she's got around a little bit, been, been here a little bit longer than me, but uh, blah, 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 blah. I don't know where it would go on from there <laughs> when it got back to him. But I decided uh, not to try to write serious stuff about him today because I knew if this room was full, it would be full of people who knew him. And if you knew him, you loved him. And so my whole job was to explain how we got along feuding and fighting <laughs> from day to day over some event that somebody had called him for, which he had told them it would be better to call me for. And of course, I was going to tell them to call him because we were pretty scarce stuff in our day. You know, there was one of him in radio, I mean, you know, where he was singular in the community as well as on the air. And then I had grown up in West Oakland, he had Hunter's Point. And so we both had our frontiers, you know, to build our following. And that was, uh, that was I guess, the thing that kept us going. I was never intruding on what he was doing. I only showed up when they really needed a picture. But he always showed up for whatever it was if you're in the Baptist church. <laughs> and so that was a life example for so many people. Show up. And when you show up, if you've got something to give, give it. Don't just talk about it. Just be there. Now, that was the raid that I fell in love with. And we became friends for life. And I put this <laughs> coat on today because there was just something about our relationship that we seemed to always need to have our coats off so that we could talk to each other uh, about things that shouldn't have mattered to either of us. But we knew they mattered to some people in our community somewhere. And so it's great that his profession let him leave a record behind. Let us listen to him whenever we feel like it. Let us know that the things that he said then also have meaning today. And it's that that gives me goosebumps. And we would sometimes get together and we, without telling each other, well, did you get a call from so-and-so yet? I told them that I was busy now. I told them you probably had a day open here. <laughs> But that was the kind of re relationship it was. We were never buddy buddies because he was covering a world of interesting things that he wanted to fix. And I was trying to do the best I could with those things that came into my view. I will miss him because there's nobody that's going to compete for me for another free show. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what we did, and we did it out of love and joy. And he was a wonderful, wonderful person. And all of us who met him know that he was sincere and enjoyed so much his own lifestyle. Thank you. Former San Francisco Mayor Willie Brown was unable to uh, be here today, but um, he sends his best wishes to the family. Our next speaker, I recently met over the telephone and email, and we just sort of bonded in that way. Ray San, um, Raphael Taliaferro. Or as he says, Rafael. <laughs> Since most of us don't know how to really pronounce his name. Well, as Gloria Duffy says, Rayfield. <laughs> And when she called me Rayfield, I got to tell you, it was during the time when we were going through this and I was kind of stressed out because she called me Rayfield and I just wanted to 
crawl up, put my thumb in my mouth, and just, it just broke me down, you know, because nobody called me that in years, and I just felt like I was with somebody that really cared. So thank you for all you've done, Gloria, and thank you to the Commonwealth Club for putting on this event and everybody for showing up. Really appreciate that. My father was a great man. He, he was a man of many talents, as you all know. Um, I often refer, refer to him as a great communicator. He loved broadcasting, he loved music, and he gave me this one piece of advice. He said, find something you love and stick with it. And when I look back, that's what he did. That's, that was his life. He found something he loved, he stuck with it. And that's about the best advice you can give anybody. So that's what my brothers did, that's what I did. And uh, one thing he was really good at was fundraising. And I know this because he, whenever I talked to him, he would tell me how great he was at fundraising. So. <laughs> and I figured um, this would be a last fundraising event for my father, so please donate to the Dementia Society of America. And I uh, just want to thank you all. And I know that he's with that big black woman in the sky right now. So, and just thank you. Thank you, Raphael. And um, for our benediction, Ray's nephew, Fred Settle. Like Raphael said, I'd like to piggyback on what uh, he said regarding Gloria, Madam President of the Commonwealth Club for you and your team putting all this together and uh, just uh, so we could have this uh, celebration for Uncle Ray. Uh, as Raphael also said, he, Uncle Ray was a man of many talents and one of those was choir directing. You may have seen in the video uh, the, the group, or at least one of the groups that he had, the Ray Tal Corral. You know, I wish I could have been a little closer to uh, Uncle Ray because I could have picked his brain on how to direct choirs. Uh, I've been a director myself for 30 years now, and uh, I'm just sure he had some uh, good points to bring out. And so uh, with that said, I'd like to offer a benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon each of you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and grant you peace. Not peace as the world gives, but the peace that passes all understanding that only he can give. I offer this benediction in the name that is above every name the only name that can save you, and that name is the incredible, majestic, loving, wonderful, matchless, and precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you all so much for coming. And on behalf of the Commonwealth Club, I'd like to thank you all for being here today. I can see Ray's face smiling and you were wonderful in this celebration, so thank you. Um, Gloria Duffy has asked that you join everyone for refreshments through the door, correct? And thank you all for coming.